Thank you. Well, I can't thank all of you for having me and for, for coming. And when I thought today about this group and you guys being here, I already know something about you because it means a lot that you would take time out of your day to come hear me talk about something you don't even really know what I'm going to talk about. But I think it's really impressive that you've taken an active or a proactive interest in, in your career and your future and your education. And so I just know based on the people that are in the room that you guys take it really seriously. And, I, and so I want to applaud all of you for that. So when Lindsay, should I call you Lindsay or Mrs. Yeah, Bill? Okay, so when, Lindsay, so when Lindsay and I got together um, back this summer and she said, hey, we would love for you to come speak. And I said, well, great, what do you want me to talk about? And she said, well, and we kind of went through a litany and Susan too, and we went through a litany of things that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And then they gave me some ideas that they pulled out of how I described that to them and said, well, you could talk about these things. And we went down several roads. So a lot of what I do in a, on a day-to-day -day basis involves, um, I mean, all I am at the end of the day is a glorified sales guy. That, that's what I do for a living. And I manage teams that do that. And our job is to grow revenue for Aon. Has anybody ever heard of Aon? If you're a soccer fan, you've heard of us because we're on, the, on, the, uh, on Manchester United soccer jersey. But, um, so Aon is the largest risk and human resources consulting firm in the world. We have about 60,000 employees. Our U.S. headquarters are in Chicago. Our global headquarters are in London. I work on the human capital side. So when we say insurance, everything I do is in, it involves human resources departments. I work with a lot of CFOs, a lot of vice presidents of human resources, sometimes CEOs. And, and a lot of the way I spend my days is trying to win business. So making presentations, negotiating deals, coaching teams on how we're gonna go in and make a presentation. So that's what I do. And so I wanted to share that with you up front so that you might better know how to maybe ask me some questions because candidly, I don't have an hour's worth of topics to cover. I'm probably, I've probably got about 30 minutes of things I could talk to you about, but what I really want is for you to stop me and go, hey, I wanna know more about that or I want to understand how you do that or why you do that because I'd much rather talk about what you want to hear than what I think you want to hear. So I hope all of you will interrupt me and, and ask me a lot of questions. So I've got a quick video that Lindsay's going to show you because when I thought about presenting for a meeting, I thought of this video and I want you to see this to see what you think. But as we do that, look at, uh, look at my bio, which is on the second page of that handout so you can kind of see what I do and then you can start, you can ask me some questions. That's it. Does anybody have any questions? That's all I have. Uh, I think my favorite part of that whole scene is where Chris Farley reaches over to grab the car and David Spade tries to stop him and he pulls back. <laughs> I think that's awesome. Uh, so, so what, b before I go any further, you guys had a second to look at my bio. Is, are, there, are there areas or topics, and I would love to hear them, I really would, so the pressure's on. 
Are there any areas or topics that you see on there that you want to make sure that I talk about today? Anybody? Yes, sir. I just had a quick question before sure. we got started. Yeah. What does a health and benefits practice specifically entail? Oh, that's a great question. Okay. Uh, so before we get started, because you were the first to ask a question, I've got a Visa gift card for you. Sweet. <laughs> Will you take it? I'll take it. 100%. All right, there it is. Thank you. All right. So, what does the health and benefits practice entail? So in our business, and you may hear me say this a couple of times, I talk about, and I shouldn't say it this way, but it's kind of a, a we and a they. We being the practice that I'm in is the health and benefits practice, and that could be, it could be anything from actual, and I'm gonna say some things and you're gonna go, I don't know what that is, so you tell me. But that could be actuarial work, it could be um, setting up um, plan designs for health and benefit plans. So, we will go into a company, I mean like Google in the next room, we work with Google. Uh, we work with Amazon, we work with uh, United Airlines, we work with the biggest companies in the world, but we also work with companies that have 100 employees. And so the way I count my clients is by head size or wise. Mm -hmm. So when some companies would say, we wanna work with that company because it's a $30 billion company. The way we make those decisions are, we really wanna work with that company because it's 3,000 lives. We want to work with companies that have people, right? Because that's how we, that's where we bring value, and that's how we get paid. So, um, so we're going to do plan designs for health and benefit plans. When you go to work after you graduate from college and you get health benefits, somebody has to design those plans with deductibles and coinsurance and who the carriers are. And you guys are like, who are carriers? Well, so carriers would be like United Healthcare and Aetna and Cigna and Blue Cross Blue Shield, and you, you guys have heard of all those. And then there's life insurance, and there's dental, and there's vision, and there are all these disability and all these other benefits that you're going to get when you go to work. That's what we that's what we do. So we're the broker that brings those benefits to the companies that you work for. And so a lot of times people are like, well, why is there a broker? Well, it's because we're going to go negotiate the best deals on the best plan designs for your employer. People don't typically know how to do that. And so we're an advocate for you. And so I would say we're as much of a consulting firm, like an ENY or a KPMG. We're as much of a consulting firm as we are insurance brokerage. Insurance brokerage just happens to be part of what we do. Okay? And so my job is to go work with clients all over the Southwest and Midwest to win their business. So that's how, that's how I am measured and my teams are measured is how well we grow our business. Does that make sense? What else? Other questions? Yes, ma'am. When you're going in and meeting these new clients, like how do you um, build and like establish the relationship with them? Oh, that's a great question. Okay, so I'm gonna start and we're gonna go there. Okay. And if at some point you don't think I've hit it, you yell at me. You ready? Good. Okay, any other questions? No, no, that's okay, yeah. What books helped you learn all this stuff that you know when you like emotional intelligence books or more? That's good. Man, y'all are asking really good questions. So, emotional intelligence books are great because what I find is people want to do business with people they like. Have you guys ever heard that? That's part of it. Um, so, I would say that. I would also say that experience is going to give you a whole lot more than anything you'll ever read in a book. But I'll pull you aside and tell you some books that I really like if you want to, you know, because frankly, I read all the time and I really don't like business books. Isn't that terrible? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, <clears throat> so networking, which we're going to talk about and kind of ties into what, what he's asking is, you know, we're going to talk about that and how I meet people and how my teams meet people because that's critical. I mean, if we walk into a brand new prospect or, or office in a meeting and, and we don't know anybody, we're in trouble. Fair enough. Anything else? What else? Anyone? Okay. Then if you didn't ask, we're going to go. Okay. So, yeah, I figured it out. Technology. Okay. So, what we always do is we begin with the end in mind. So, well, and, and I, a lot of the things I'm going to say to you today could be, could involve business meetings, right? Like you guys are sitting back going, what happens when I go to work? Like when I go to a meeting, what happens? But what I would tell you is that what I'm going to talk about today doesn't have to be a meeting at work. 
It could be social. It could be. It could one day be in your marriage. It could be the way you interact with other people everywhere you go. It doesn't just have to be in business. But I have found that it happens to work pretty well in business. So what we do is we establish the goal before we go to the meeting. And so I'm going to pass some of these out in a second. And these are brochures that we've created. And this is actually something that you're going to think is really strange. I actually enjoy th this. Gives me energy. Mm -hmm. I actually like doing these. I like putting brochures together and, and, and talking about what we do, but I don't just throw them together and think, hey, I hope I, I, hope I talk about something you like because I just spent an hour, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stand here for an hour and talk about this. So what we do is we talk to our clients ahead of time and say, when we come to the meeting, what do you wanna talk about? What, what's the agenda today? And we'll call them ahead of time or we'll email them and we'll say, hey, we really appreciate you giving us this amount of time to come present to you. What do you want to hear? What do you want to know about? Because we have, in our company, in the area that I work in, we have 92 service lines. 92. There's no way I could cover them all in an hour, right? Couldn't cover them in, in an afternoon. So we try to get people to talk to us about what they want to know. And then, and then the other thing we always do, and I think this is so critical for you guys in a meeting, and even in an interview, and this is radical. Are you ready? You ready for something radical? When somebody invites you to come into a meeting with them for something that you want to accomplish, right? You either want to win the business or you want to get the job or you want to, I mean, there's a goal, right? There's a reason. You didn't just show up. So what I would encourage you to do is ask that person or those people at the end of this process, whatever it is, you're trying to get the job or win the deal, if you don't win, would they be willing to sit down and debrief with you and learn and you so you can learn why you didn't win? I mean, it might be weird if you did it on a date. I'm not sure I would do that. Like, if you say no, I want to debrief and find out why you didn't go out with me, that might not work. But, but in an interview, what more valuable information could you get than for someone to sit down with you and say, what's your name? John. John, how you doing? Good, how are you? I'm great. So if you say, if John says, hey, Jay, I really appreciate the opportunity to interview with you. If I don't get the job or at the end of this process, one thing I would love for you to do is sit down with me and talk to me about what I can do differently because that's how I grow. I will tell you, you will never grow more than you will when you lose. <laughs> and I've lost a lot. I've lost a lot of deals in my life. I've not gotten some jobs in my life. And I've always found that when I don't win, I learn a lot. Right? So that's the upside to losing. Other than that, can't tell you much that's good about losing. It's really bad. So anyway, any questions, comments, thoughts about that? Anybody? Anybody? Yes. So do you think it's appropriate to ask that question before you even start the process, or is it more appropriate afterwards? And you just want a gift card. Oh, sweet. All right. So <laughs> I think that um, in an interview process, that's awkward, isn't it? Because if you said that on the front end, you could almost be saying, hey, there's a chance I might not get the job. So, and you don't want to say that, do you? Right? So what I would suggest is that you just say, hey, at the end of this process, win, lose, or draw, would you be willing to sit down with me and talk to me about how I'm, how I'm progressing or how I'm doing? I'd just love to hear your insight on, on what I'm doing. Right? I mean, I would love to hear that if I won or lost the job. I, I would want to know, why did I get the job? What is it that you think I'm good at? Because I better be good at it. <laughs> I mean, if I win the job, because the reality is in my career, I'm applying for a job every time I go to a meeting. Y'all ever thought about that? Every time I go to a meeting, I'm asking you to give me the job because I want to be your benefits consultant. I want my team to be your benefits consultant. Cool? Any thoughts? Questions? So, all right, so moving along, um, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna say is that at the end of our meeting, make sure I'm going through here fast enough. So here are some, here are some ideas around what I, want, what I want at the conclusion. So what do I wanna accomplish? So that's how I'm gonna, that's how I'm gonna design the presentation. Do, do I want a next meeting? So what I tell my teams a lot is, Hey guys and girls, uh, we want we want to create an impending event. Now, because anybody, get anybody, just give me a guess. What do you think? I, when I say I want to create an impending event, what would you guess that is? Anybody? You want them to remember you after you leave. Cool. Great. Hey, you want a Visa gift card? 
because I, mean, I, I mean I have one. So so what so what an impending event is is it could be another meeting. It could be another meeting. It could be an assignment. Like I may want my prospect to say, hey, what we would really love to do. What I hope happens at the end, we were talking about data analytics before the, um, before the meeting started. I might want the prospect to look at me and go, you know what, Jay? Your team mentioned that you have a, a treasure trove full of data. And, and they'd be right. I mean, we've got data on 10 million U.S. employees. 10 million. And several billion dollars in healthcare spend. So you think I've got some data? I mean, we got some data. So if they say to me, hey, we'd love for you to do a benchmark for us, or we would love for you to come back and explain to us what other companies are doing right here, that's an impending event, right? That's a, okay, now we have a reason to go back. That's all we want. Sometimes a win is a meeting. I mean, look, we're in the business of calling on clients that we want to do business with, and they say no to us for years, not weeks, not days, weeks, or months years they'll say I'm not interested I've got somebody that does what you do I don't like you go away right that's a hard thing to do how many of you think you could do that anybody this guy can do it so can you it's hard but man when you win it's cool really cool there's a lot of high fives so all right so I'm gonna move on any other questions about how you, what your goal is right your goal may be uh, another interview right that may be all you hope for, but that's okay. You establish that, right? So then we prepare. What do you know about your audience? Are they young? Are they old? Are they tech savvy? Are they not? Are they men? Are they women? And this is not, when I say these things, and I think, yeah. Sorry, yeah, jump no. back to what we were just talking about. Yeah. What if someone's setting up a meeting with you and they don't really give you an agenda and you don't really know what to expect out of it, is it appropriate for you to try to set expectations? Great and question. Yeah, I always do. You know, a lot of people I work with, when they call, you know, they tell me your name again. Micah. Micah, that's right. I knew that. So they call you and they say, hey, Micah, we, uh, I'm with Aon in Houston, and I don't even know if I told you guys that. I live in Houston. It's hot there. There's a lot of traffic. And sometimes we have hurricanes. And, um, and, and you call, and I call Micah, and I say, Micah, you know what? And I, this is a real life phone call. Y'all ready? Hey, Micah. Um, <clears throat> this is Jay Robinson. I work with Aon in Houston. I'm actually in our health and benefits practice. We work with a lot of energy firms. Everything I said is true. And we've done a terrible job of staying in touch with you and being in front of you and demonstrating to you what we do for our clients. And we would love an opportunity to come over and visit with you. I think you and I met at that luncheon, something. And you say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I say, would you be willing to entertain us for 30 minutes? Could we just come by and introduce ourselves and just kind of talk about what you're doing? And you go, yeah, okay, sure, we can do that. So in that case, I just asked you if you would spend 30 minutes with my team. Man, we ain't gonna get anything done in 30 minutes. But we might create an impending event, right? right. Which means mama gets a new pair of shoes if we keep going, right? I mean, you know what I'm saying? So, does that make sense? There are plenty of girls in here I know you like new shoes. I mean, don't act like you don't, because I know you do. So, does that make sense? Yeah. Did I answer your question? Yes. So, I don't know what we're going to talk about other than I'm going to try to get to be friends with you. Because I need you and I need to be friends if I'm ever going to do business with you. Cool? Anything else? Okay. So, here's what I love for you. That so, you guys are so much better at this. You haven't even gotten out of college yet, and you're going to be better at this than I ever was. And that is being able to do research and data mining and background on the people and the companies that you work with or that you want to work with, right? You guys have got a million ways to do that. And there are other ways to do it you don't even know about yet. So, like in my business, there's a website called My Edge. I can literally go on myedge.com and use my username and password, and I can see everything. What's your name? Spencer. Spencer. I can go look at your company's uh, some, some file, public filings that you have to make on your company's benefits, and I can see who you use as a consultant. I can see when you renew your health benefits. I can see how many employees are on it. 
I can even see how much you pay your consultant for his services or her services. I can see all of that. Isn't that crazy? The craziest thing is it still doesn't get me the job sometimes. <laughs> but, I mean, but it's amazing what we can find out, right? And you guys are going to be super good at it because you guys are so much more technologically advanced than I'll ever be. So we do all of that. We're looking at LinkedIn. We're looking at Google. We're looking at um, MyEdge. We're looking at all these databases to find out everything we can learn before we ever walk in the meeting. And I'll tell you a couple of really what, what I was thinking about when I was preparing to talk to you, some things I thought you would think are cool, is I can go on LinkedIn. What's your name? Cole. Cole. So let's say Cole's working for the, he, Cole's going to be in the meeting, right? So Cole and I have got a meeting tomorrow. And there's going to be five people on Cole's team in that meeting. I can go research Cole and all of his colleagues on LinkedIn, and I can find out where Cole used to work. I can find out where he went to college. I might even find out where his spouse works. I mean, I can find out all kinds of things because, and you guys know how to do all that. But what's really cool is once I know all that about Cole, then I can go do some research on the companies that he's worked for in the past and find out who they used as their consultant. So now I know who Cole's done business with in the past and all of his teammates. So I know walking in that he likes my competitor better than he likes me. Or he worked with my company before, right? And I can go, let's just say he's worked with my company before. I'll call the consultants in Washington, D.C. and I'll say, hey, did you guys work with Cole when he was at Brand X? And they'll say, yeah, yeah, we know Cole. I'll be like, well, what? What does it for Cole? Because I want to do business. I want to do business with Cole. And they'll be like, Yeah, well, don't go in there. Do not wear a blue suit. Because he hates blue suits. And I'm like, okay, okay, what else? Right. You don't care about blue suits. Yeah, okay. That's cool. All right. But you see what I'm saying? So we know a ton of information about who's going to be sitting there before we ever walk in the meeting. And I feel so um, just sneaky and and accomplished when I know when I walk in there, I'm gonna know more. I'm gonna know a lot, right? And it's, yeah. Um, that, that I love, like this is great, how we can learn so much about people, but at which point does it become too much and come across as creepy? Well, I'm not gonna tell them what I know. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm not, right, great question. So I'm not gonna sit down and go, hey, I happen to know <laughs> that you raise bulldogs on the side. I'm not gonna do that, but I am gonna go in and think, I mean, like one of the things I'm gonna know is if you, so one of our big competitors is Marsh and their, and their health and benefits division is called Mercer. You guys may have heard of Marsh, it's a big company. So I may know that you worked with Marsh in the past. I'm never gonna say that, but I'm gonna make sure that my team talks about things that make us better than Marsh. Oh. You see what I'm saying? So you're gonna be sitting there thinking, well, I've done business with Marsh and I think they're pretty, oh, wait a minute, what'd you just say? <laughs> you know, you're gonna go, you guys do that? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, and then last but not least, I just said, and this is going to be good for you for the rest of your life. Don't kill somebody with a deck. <laughs> These things I'm showing you right here, people hate those when they're an inch thick, and you're never going to have time to get through it anyway, right? Quick anecdotal story. I so we I work with a bunch of actuaries. Does anybody know what an actuary is? They're the smartest people in the room. I'm serious. They are really smart. They're not always the most um, socially adept people. Now, if you're studying to be an actuary, you have my utmost respect because I'm not that smart. So I love actuaries, love them. But they're funny about the way they interact with people. And so, they, so this guy, he's gonna make a presentation to a big hospital system in Houston. And his boss said, hey, have you shown your presentation to Jay? Maybe he can help you with your presentation. He goes, well, I hadn't thought about that. I guess I'll take it over there and show it to him. So he comes over there, and he literally he comes in and he goes, hey, I got this presentation. I want you to look at it. And, and, and like this. And I'm like, holy smokes, how many pages is that? He goes, 74. <laughs> I said, well, how long have you got to make the presentation? He said, we got an hour and a half. I, said, I looked at him and I said, Jason, you do realize that if you go in there with 74 pages and you got 90 minutes to do it, that you got to do a page every minute and 16 seconds. Now, I'm not an actuary, but that's my math, and that's going to be hard to do. And he was like, I didn't think about that. I was like, yeah, you need to scale that down, right? I mean, he needed to cut that by two-thirds, right? And you do, too. The more you know about your topic, and you will know a lot, the less you have to say. Remember that. A very smart guy taught me that. 
I'm, I'm dead serious. I'm a very talented guy. I said, Jay, when you go into the presentation, you don't have to say a lot because you know more about it than anybody else does, so you shouldn't have to say a lot. You only need to say what's important, what's perfect. Okay, how are we doing? Good? Questions, comments? Anybody? Um, yeah, Was there is there any other websites like in my Edge websites for researching companies and employers? And there, there are. Um, so there's another one that's actually, my Edge, you have to have a password for it. You have to buy it. I figured. Yeah, but there's another one called Free Erisa, and it's F-R-E-E-E-R-I-S-A. It won't mean much to you. But but ERISA is the or ERISA is for the uh, federal laws that govern benefits, and you have to file a 5500. It's a form that you have to file that discloses what you offer your employees. So I, if I have a company, I'm running a company, I have to file a 5500 that shows my uh, what my employee, what kind of benefits I'm offering. It's free. Now you have to sign up. You have to get a username and password, but there's no charge. And you can get in there, and a lot of it wouldn't mean anything to you, but you'd probably be shocked at how much you can find out. It is interesting. Um, there are others. Pull me aside afterwards, I'll think of them, just on the, off the top of my head, but there's a bunch. I mean, the Wall Street Journal is a great place. Yahoo Finance is a great place. So, I, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start passing some of these out, so as I go through, you can attach what I'm saying to what I do. And a couple of these that I think are interesting, and I hope you do too, <laughs> is um, I think this one's pretty cool. So the one with the helicopter on it. So we did this last, um, kind of last winter or <coughs> spring. PHI, is anybody here from Louisiana? Anybody? Okay. Good, let's talk about it. No, I'm good. Um, so, uh, so PHI is Petroleum Helicopters, Inc. I, I, I love aviation, so it's kind of fun when I get a chance to work on something like that. So PHI is based in Lafayette, and if you've ever been along the Gulf Coast and seen those bright yellow helicopters, those are PHI helicopters. And they fly offshore to the oil rigs, and they also do medevac work, so they pick up injured people in remote places, and they do it all over the world. I think they're a really fascinating company. And we got an opportunity to go in and present to them, and we won the business. And I'll be the first to tell you, some of the stuff I'm going to show you, we didn't win the business. But I'm still proud of the work we did. And so you guys can flip through these. If, if you want to uh, you want to grab one or two and just pass them back, those are all the same brochures. And then the other one that I thought was interesting is, anybody from the Midwest, like, where are you from? Chicago. Chicago and St. Louis. And where are you from? Michigan. Michigan, okay. Have you ever heard of Pomps? The tire store? It's okay if you haven't. So Pomps does refurbishing of these huge 18-wheeler, like thick, like tires as high as the ceiling. And so they do ultrasonic testing to see if the tire is sound enough to rebuild it. Because you know when you're driving down the freeway and you see those giant 18-wheeler tires and they've been blown out? Those tires can be rebuilt if they're safe enough, if they're, if they're worthy, roadworthy. So Pomps rebuilds those tires and, and sells them again. And then they also have retail stores, and they're based in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And so we were up there two weeks ago working in Wisconsin on pumps. And one of these, so there's a finalist presentation. Somebody was asking me earlier. So this booklet is the one I took initially. I had no idea what we were going to talk about. No idea. So I created a book and just took it in case we needed to talk about something. We got an impending event. We got a finalist presentation, and we went back in there two weeks ago, and this is the book that we created. And this is the one, I'm sorry I only have one, I think, but you guys really ought to take a look at this because this was what we used to win the business. And I think in one of these, you'll actually, as you flip through it, you might even see some of my handwritten notes. Oh, I'm sorry, it's this one. So this one, you'll actually see my handwritten notes along some of the things I'm going to talk about here in the next few minutes, and you'll go, wow, this really did happen. I mean, like this, he's not kidding. That really is how he does. <laughs> so I'll pass those around to you. Um, how are we doing? Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Um, so Spencer. So you need to know about your audience when you're going into pitch. Um, yes. So you're probably pitching to executives, CFOs, whatever it might yep. be. Um, let's say you're pitching for like a company that might be comprised mostly of younger people. Yeah. And um, you know, Aon has all the research on employee mindset and how younger people want different benefits. Sure. Um, how do you get that across to um, the older guys, whoever you're pitching to? Um, do you just show them the research or do you have to kind of get in their head? And uh huh. 
How do you do that? <laughs> Everything you just said. Yeah, so we'll go in and we'll talk about that. And then we'll also take the benchmarking. When we have benchmarking, I think I mentioned it earlier, so I can tell you that, but if I show it to you and prove it with the data, you're really impressed, right? And I can say, look, this is the average spend your peers are making on their employees, and these, these companies look like you. Their average employee age is, anybody want to guess what the average employee age is in the workforce? 32. Anybody? What was it? 32. 42. So the average employee, you were really close. I mean, you were really close. 42 is the average age. So typically people, you know, you'll be in a meeting and they'll go, well, you don't understand, Jay, our people are old. And I'll be like, really, how old? And they'll go, well, our average age is 41. you are like, well, actually, that's not old. That's hit right down the middle, right? Um, since you asked, has anybody ever eaten Whataburger? Yeah, <laughs> that's, it's pretty good, isn't it? It's not as good as In-N-Out, but it's close. <laughs> By the way, we do business with In-N-Out, too. So, I love the Whataburger story. We worked for years to win Whataburger. We also worked for years to win PHI, the helicopter company. We worked for years. They told me no to get out of their face for three years. Uh, and we just won the business. And it'll be, over, it'll be an over $300,000 account when we're finished. So, I'm really I'm proud of that one. Really proud of the team. Um, Whataburger. So we walked in Whataburger. Does anybody know what their colors are? If you think about Whataburger, so their colors are identical to Tennessee. I'm sorry, but they just are. So their colors are orange and white, same orange. So we walked into the finalist presentation and all of the men bought orange and white striped ties that matched their colors. And we all wore them. And the women put on blouses and they put them on too. So we all walked in with their ties. And we went to one of their locations and begged the manager to give us their trays, those orange serving trays with the little tent card numbers, like your number 49, right? We got them to give us those, and we served them the finalist presentations on their trays with their ties on, and they loved it. Well, guess what? The way we found out is we found somebody who used to work in their HR department, and we said, hey, what what do we got to do to win this? And they're like, look, they're super laid back, and they love creativity, and they call their uh, they call their employees. Do they call them team members, or I think it was team members, I think. And they said, don't call them employees, call them team members. They'll think that's they'll they'll be really impressed. So we did, and we did everything we were told to do. We got coached, right? Now we weren't creepy, right? <laughs> but but we learned, right? This is what's going to do it. And guess what? It did it. We won it. We won it. It, it was the coolest thing. Anybody got any questions? <clears throat> okay, so. All right, I'm going to move along a little bit. Okay, so the rehearsal. If you turn to the next page in there, rehearsal's the best part of the, the best part of the story. Okay? We rehearse it to death. Okay? Because if you rehearse well, you'll present well. So just to give you a quick example. Pops, that one I'm showing you, and y'all are passing those around, right? So make sure everybody gets a chance to look at them. So Pops is in Green Bay, Wisconsin. So I had a team of people going to Green Bay to make the finalist presentation, and some of us didn't know each other. <laughs> Worst mistake in the world, are you ready? I'm gonna tell you a lot, because I've made a bunch. Worst mistake in the world is to walk in, walk into a big meeting where there's 10 people in the meeting, and Lindsay and I are working together, and Lindsay is the consultant. She's the senior consultant on the deal. I'm the relationship manager, so my job is to be friendly and make sure everybody's happy, right? Lindsay and I get on the elevator together in Green Bay, and I go, hey, how are you? I'm Jay. And we've never met. I've never seen Lindsay, because she works in Chicago, or Indy, or somewhere else, and we've never worked together. That's terrible. Don't ever do that. So we get together, um, the whole team got together in the lobby of the hotel the night before, and we drank beer, <laughs> and we rehearsed for like two and a half hours. We rehearsed. And those booklets you guys are looking at, everybody on the team, there's four of us going into the meeting, everybody on the team has a job, they have a role. If they don't have a role in the booklet, they're not on the team. You don't need to be going into a meeting unless you've got something relevant to say and offer, right? And we go through it line by line. I mean everything. And we laugh and we tease each other. I mean, it's it's horrible. I mean, it's like you think about sitting around with your buddies 
and y'all give each other heart, you give your buddies a hard time. See what I'm saying? I mean, that's what we do. Right? You're not going to wear that, are you? I mean, we really. <laughs> not talking about what you're wearing, but but we do that, and so we're like, okay. Then the last thing we do, we decide. You, you guys might be shocked by this. We will even do things like we will walk through the individuals in the, that are coming to the meeting and talk about who needs to sit next to them, right? Because if, I know if Susan is an actuary, remember when I was talking about actuaries, man, she's super smart, at least for this experience. <laughs> she's super smart, and she's an actuary, and I know the CFO of the company is going to be in the meeting, right? The CFO scares me to death because I don't have any earthly idea what to talk about. But, you, know, you count money? I mean, I don't know what to say. <laughs> so, so, so I know the CFO is concerned about modeling his health plans for an economic outcome that raises. He's trying to save money, or she, they, are trying to save money, right? Well, I know Susan is the best actuary that I could pick to have in the meeting to talk about how we're gonna save them money, right? So guess where I want Susan to sit? Anybody, it's not hard. By the CFO. By the CFO, right? So Susan and I talk about it, like, hey man, when we get in the meeting, <laughs> I'm gonna just sort of like start moving down the right. <laughs> you just probably because what and then you know what happens, we get in the meeting and there's like a chair missing. There's I mean something always goes wrong. But we try to do that and we rehearse it. I mean we rehearse that. Does that surprise you guys? There's a method to everything. It, but but you keep I keep coming I forgot your name. Tell me John. John. John made a great point. Are we creepy? No, they don't know. I'm like, right? The CFO thinks she's random. He's like, oh, I guess I'm sitting next to the actuary. Oh. <laughs> right? But see what I'm saying? And so the rehearsal is over when everybody understands their part. Everybody's got it. And we're laughing, and we've had our third beer, and it's time to go eat dinner. We're done. Got it. Any questions? Are you surprised at any of it? I mean, is, what, how does it impact you? Very strategic phone time. Yeah, no, that sounds good. You like it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're doing everything possible to maximize the best results you can get, right? So you're nitpicking each and every step of the process to, to like, ensure your best results. Yeah, Not leave nothing to chance, right? Yeah. So since you planned it out so meticulously, how do you deal with curveballs? Oh, I love it. That's, that's exactly where I was going. Because, you know, who is it? Mike Tyson? You know what I'm going to say, his famous quote? Does anybody know Mike Tyson's famous quote about, about fighting or about... Everybody's got a plan to get hit. Everybody's got a plan to get hit in the face, right? <laughs> right? That's true. So, I mean, we go into the meeting and we're like, hey, something's going to go wrong, right? Something's going to go wrong. It's going to pour down rain on the way in and our materials are going to get wet. Uh, somebody's flight's going to get delayed. Um, somebody forgot their tie. I mean, some, something's going to go wrong. So you gotta be flexible, and you gotta be willing to roll with it, right? Because here's the thing, you can't, you can't come down too hard on your teammates and get tough on each other, because you gotta deal to win. You gotta deal to pitch, right? So you're going in there, and you're like, hey, what's your name? TJ. TJ, yeah, so I'm saying, hey, TJ, hey, look, man, don't worry about it. Don't worry about the tie. Look, I got an extra one, or we'll run by and get you one. It might not look good, but we'll get you one. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? You just gotta move forward, and when you get in the meeting, that's where I'm going to talk a second about being tone deaf. You ever heard tone deaf? I'm about to talk about that. So here's me. It's better to remain silent and appear a fool than to open one's mouth and remove all doubt. I just think that's funny. I should put that on my closures because I kind of think it applies to me. But anyway, um, so here's how we do this. You guys that have the brochures might see on some of those on the first or second page, it says something like what we heard from you or topics that you've discussed or that you've raised or whatever. So I love doing this and sometimes this is my only role in the meeting personally because I don't have a lot to offer in those meetings. What I want is I want my teammates, remember my teammates? This is my consultant and this is my actuary. Uh, I need a benefit specialist. What's your name? <laughs> Alan. Alec, you're my benefit specialist. So, so I, my goal in that meeting is I want them to love these people. I want them to go, man, Jay told us he's going to bring the best people in the industry to meet with us. I did. I brought these people. 
So I want them to do most of the talking and presenting because I want them to feel good about me, right? Does that make sense? So that's what we're doing. And I'm going to get those people in the meeting to go through that, lit, that page that you see, like the second page of those documents, and I'm going to get them to confirm back to me that that's what they want to hear, right? Because you might look at it and go, hey, Jay, you forgot this one thing. I told you, you know, TJ says, hey, there's this thing we talked about on the phone, remember? I don't see it here. Well, that's okay. I'm glad he told me because the worst thing that can happen is he didn't tell me, and we don't, do, we don't talk about it, right? So I get them all, the, everybody buys in, right? Everybody buys in. And once we've established that and they've told us who they are and what they do, and we are rolling. And that's what we're going to talk about. And there's this weird thing called the hammock effect. Now, I've got it drawn somewhere in some notes someplace. But you know what a hammock looks like. So on one end of the hammock, the high end of the hammock, that's the first 10 minutes of the meeting. Everybody's listening. In the first 10 minutes of a meeting, everybody's engaged. Everybody's like, cool, what's this guy? What are they going to talk about, right? Then it starts doing this. And this, is right, y'all ready? This right here is grocery list. I need a nap. What are we having for lunch? What did I have for lunch? Alabama just beat LSU. Some, some, some. I hate Auburn. Just keeps up, right? And then at the end of the meeting, you're back, right? You're back. Hey, everybody's back. And just, do you know when you're back? It's at the point where I go, in conclusion. <laughs> I'm serious. So the first 10% of the meeting and the last 10% of the meeting is where everybody listens. The rest of it, people are like, oh, blah, 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 and they're looking at their phone. I've literally had some of the most senior people in the organization going through their phones while they're sitting right next to me, and I've just flown across the country and spent 40 hours on a presentation, and they're looking at their phones. That's awful, but it happens. So, so that first 10% of the meeting, and you better hit them in the mouth with something, right? Just like Mike Tyson. Some of you probably don't even know who Mike Tyson is. <laughs> So, but you better give them something to chew on quick or you've lost them. So our goal is to walk in and go, um, hey, Susan, Susan's not the actor anymore. She's the CFO now. So I go, hey, Susan, remember you said in the first conversation we ever had that you were trying to figure out how to mitigate trend and cost in your health plan. You spend $44 million a year on your health plan right now, and you are not going to keep doing that. And what are we going to do about it? So here's what we're gonna do. And then I look, and now you're the actuary. And I look at, at Lindsay, I say, Lindsay, why don't you go ahead and talk to Susan about how we discussed doing that, okay? Because that's it, man, we got one shot. And we're there. And we didn't sit back, now here's how we used to do it, okay? Here's how you don't do it. Hey, how are you? Um, Spencer, I'm Jay, this is Lindsay. Yes. And this is Alec, and we work for Aon in Houston, and Aon's huge, and we rock. And um, we have 50,000 employees and $10 billion in data and so on and something, and we're really good. Everybody says that. Everybody that walks in the door says they're great, and let me give you some statistics on our company, right? They don't want to hear they don't. How does that apply to you? Do you really care? I don't. You really don't. <laughs> so let's talk about something you care about, which is... How are you going to mitigate a $44 million trend in your health benefits, right? So, boom, we're going right there. And what happens is then in that, remember the hammock? So when we get down in this low part where normally everybody's looking at their grocery list, well, because we started with something that matters, people are going to be more engaged. And they're going to go, holy crap, that guy just said we could mitigate a $44 million cost. Let's take notes, right? <laughs> Nobody else did that. Everybody else came in and talked about their company. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Questions, comments, smart remarks. Come on, I know you got them. Okay, Micah. Um, Robert Herjavec, one of the sharks on Shark Tank, oh, in gosh. his book he talks about. Uh, <laughs> You're about to go over my head. No, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> he talks about um, in meetings, like in sales pitches. There was a time where um, he had someone up there doing a sales pitch uh, on his team. And he could tell it just wasn't going good. And so he just jumped in and noticed that one of the executives was wearing like designer sunglasses. And he started talking to him about designer clothes and went from there. Yeah. At what point do you just kind of throw out your book and just kind of just get to know them yep. in that in that later meeting? That happens. And so we're at, and I don't know if you guys see at the bottom where I said, don't be tone deaf. <coughs> don't be tone deaf, do be flexible. Okay. Perfect anecdotal story right where you're going. 
So we're in a meeting in Dallas in front of an energy company, right? Those people that poke holes in the ground and get oil. So we're sitting there and, um, and the CFO's in the meeting and we've got our whole presentation planned out. We're so smart and we got this whole team here. And, and the CFO goes, uh, <clears throat> yeah, this is what I wanna know. I wanna know this. And he, he, he literally flipped through the book and found page eight, you know, and he goes, this is what I wanna talk about, okay? Well, the senior consultant, who's a great guy, he's a little tone deaf, and he wasn't listening. And he said, so if you turn to page two, because that's his role, right? He's next, it's, her, it's his turn in our presentation. If you turn to page two, we're gonna talk about this thing with this guy, and right here, right here. And I was like, oh my gosh, Mike, don't, he just told you what he wants to hear. Don't go, listen to what the guy just said. Listen to, right? It just tanked. You just went off the deep end. So you just got to blow it up. And you got to be a little, it's tough, but you got to find a way to go, hey, you know what? Hey, let's back up for a second. Can we just back up for a second? Because what I just heard Micah say is um, page eight is really important. Right, Micah? Hey, Mike, let's just go to page eight. Let's just go to page eight. I know we were going to go talk about page three, but let's just go on to eight, you know? You got to be in charge of somebody's got to be in charge of that. Somebody's got to make sure you don't just spin off into nowhere, right? And it happens. And that's what I call being tone deaf. That's tone deaf. You didn't pick up, you know. I'll tell you a, ter a terrible one. I have an employee that does it and drives me crazy. Is when somebody says, "Hey, look, you know, we gig an hour, uh, and I'm so sorry, but I've got another call, or I've got a meeting, or blah blah blah," right? And that happens. People are busy. And my employee will go, yeah, so the last couple things we want to talk to you about. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> he just told you he's leaving. Everything you're saying right now, he is going to hear a word. Be flexible. Be flexible. Go, hey, I got it. You got a meeting? I don't want to make you late. When can we get back together? Right? You just got to do it. Do you have any tips for kind of maybe tactfully changing course or taking over when someone else is talking even like, like in class presentations, you know, sometimes we'll be talking and someone won't know what they're talking about. You kind of want to take the reins. Do you have any uh, tips on how to do that not awkwardly? Um, no. <laughs> um, I mean, it happens. It happens. I was the biggest, has anybody ever heard of Stuart Title? They're a title company and they're, they're global. They got 7,000 employees. We got an opportunity to sit in the, in the conference room with their CEO. And he said, And I don't know how much this will mean to you guys, but he said, we're out of compliance. Like we, I don't want to say we've broken the law, but we've not done some things we should have done. Like kind of like filing income tax, right? You'd say, I, I haven't intentionally broken the law, but I clearly didn't file my taxes appropriately. So I got to go back and fix that, right? You're not going to jail yet. <laughs> and he said, we're out of compliance on this issue. And I know we've got to get this fixed. And it was a serious conversation. And I was like, And the guy sitting to my left said, well, part of what we're going to do for you is, is unwind that and then fix it. And he goes, I've already fixed it. I've already addressed it. We've got it taken care of. We don't need to deal with that anymore. I don't ever want to talk about it again. I don't ever want to look in the rear view mirror at that. It's disgusting. And this guy sitting on my team says, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but that's just part of what we do. because there's ladies in the room, I can't tell you what was going through my mind, but it's a dirty word. <laughs> and I was like, holy crap, this guy's not, he doesn't hear it. He's not listening. He just kept doing it. And I thought that CFO, or the CEO, was going to lose his mind. And I don't, I don't blame him. And so I just stopped. I said, hey, you know what? It's TJ, right? I said, hey, TJ, I think what you're saying <laughs> is that you feel like that's been resolved and you don't want to talk about it anymore and you're not going to pay us to fix it because it's fixed and you don't want to know how that happened or what happened you just want to go forward am i hearing you right yep so i look at the guy sitting there okay i think we're good i think we're, we're good there let's move on so what else are you going to do for him <laughs> right we just that's how i did it i'm not saying it's right it's hard okay what else i'm done on presentations did you guys get anything out of that I'm not giving you a gift card. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, how do you select who goes in and presents or is on the team, and what if they need some um, training yeah. or something before 
or so you know if you've got an actuary or you've got somebody that just doesn't like to do that but yeah. realizes yeah. that's now a part of their job. Yeah. How do you prepare somebody? Great question. So everybody in this room that's in college right now hopefully will end up in a situation where you get asked to be a part of something like this. And it'll happen. And you're going to be scared to death. And if you're not, then you ain't thinking about it. Because it, it, it's not it's 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 not scary, but it's um it's intense, right? It's like it's nerve wracking. It's intense, and you don't want to let your team down, do you? I mean, if any of you've ever played on a team before, you don't want to be the guy that or girl that that doesn't make the play, right? And so you're not going to be asked to do this until somebody believes you can, or somebody believes you can be taught. And guess what? You can be taught. Everybody in this room can learn. Everybody. If you if that's what you're doing right now, you know what you, your college degree basically. All you're getting in a college degree is you're proving to everybody else that you've got the wherewithal to sit down in the classroom and learn. Really? I mean, you know, you, you, you don't have any experience really except for your internship. So I love it when I get people like you, and I do a lot. They start at the bottom and they come in and they're crunching numbers all day and they're looking at computer screens and they're doing research. And when, they, when they've been with us long enough to kind of get it, I'll pull them aside and I'll say, hey, I think you're ready to go make this pitch with us. You want to go? They're like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you get them in the rehearsal and then, then they, they, this is what they do. They go, <laughs> right? And so what I always tell them is nobody, Alec, nobody knows more about your job than you. You're good at it. You know what you do. So in the first meeting, the only thing you have to do in the presentation is tell the client what you do. You're gonna, what's your last name? Uh, CTARS. Alex Cetarst. That's right. So he's going to say, I'm Alex Cetarst. I'm a um, benefit specialist at Aon in Houston, Dallas, Austin, Chicago. And this is what I do. And this is how I help my client. And this is why my clients call me. And these are the times they need me. And that's going to happen when you're 25 years old. That's going to happen quick. So that's what we do. And we make sure they know. And they say it. And I say, Alex, say it to me. And, you, <laughs> and the guy or the girl says, I'm not saying I'm like, no, no, no. Smile and act like you like it, and the, and they'll go, oh okay. Well, I answer the phone and I help my client when they call because they need help. And some some, and I'm like, that's what you say when we look at you and it's your turn to talk. That's what you say, and the client will say, oh well, I probably need your help, and you go, yeah, that's what I'm here for. I'm your man. <laughs> right? I mean, right? That's how we teach it. What else? Some of the stuff I put up here is probably more relevant than anything I just talked about and I gave it the least amount of time. <laughs> because I just, as Lindsay said, you know, you can talk about interviews, you can talk about life, you can talk about how you got there, whatever. So a couple of quick things I will share with you. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna go kind of fast. When you're in an interview, don't be afraid to ask for what you want. And don't be shocked if you don't get it. And don't let that be the end of your world. You're going to interview for the rest of your life, whether you do it internally or externally, to go leave your company and go find another one. And it's okay if you interview with a dozen companies at the same time. Just do it, all right? At some point, you're going to get married to one of these companies. You better date several and make sure you know which one you like. Because <laughs> it's important, right? That's okay. Sometimes you're going to have a short-term loss for a long-term gain. Sometimes you're going to go, well, I'm making $80,000 right now. I'm not about to go over there and work for seventy-four. <laughs> well, maybe you should. Maybe there are some reasons you should go make seventy-four for a year so you can make hundred and fifty next year, right? Don't, don't shoot your foot off. That's a stupid phrase we use in Texas, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> don't shoot your foot off either. I mean, that would be bad too. Um, when you're in an interview, be engaged, have manners, ask questions. You can never ask enough questions in an interview, okay? Trust me, you can never ask enough questions. Because if I ask you questions, what do you, think I, what do you think of me when I'm asking you a bunch of questions? What do you think about me? Anybody, just anybody, yeah. That you're engaged in, excuse me, engaged, engaged and interested in what's going on. Yeah, that I care. 
right? What's your name? Grayson. Grayson, hey, you just won 25 bucks. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and, and I can't find the little receipt thing, so hopefully. Anyway. Um, so, yeah, you got to ask questions. I have introduced some people to some super high-ranking people <coughs> that are your age, just a hair older than you, and they walk into the meeting and they sit there and they don't have any questions and they're probably not dressed appropriately and they think, and don't ever think this, they think that because I'm there and I, and I introduced them, they think they've got the job. Don't ever think that. You don't have the job until somebody hands you an employment agreement and says, here, sign this. That's when you have the job. Whoever takes you in there loves you and wants you to get a good job, but they can't get the job for you unless they're the one making the hire. Cool? Questions? Worst possible thing you can do once you've got a job is go sit down in front of your boss and tell him what you want. And it happens all the time. Let me be your parent for 30 seconds, okay? The question you ask, are you ready? You don't hear me say anything else. The question you ask is, what can I do to get there? I want to be over there. I want to do that. I want to make that much money. I want to get to go to those meetings. I want to get to work on those projects. Those are all fantastic wants and desires. Those are awesome. But you don't get them because you go sit down and stomp your foot. You get them because you did what it took to get there, and you've got to find out what that is. Go ask your boss. All right, then the other thing I'll say is, no matter where you go to work, get a mentor. Get a guy or get a girl that loves you and wants to see you succeed. And oh, by the way, make sure they're successful. <laughs> don't go find somebody that's not cutting it and say, hey, will you be my mentor? And you really don't even have to ask sometimes. You can just go and say, hey, I really like the way you do this stuff. Will you help me? Done. And that's the best way to become a leader too, by the way. If you want to be a leader in your organization, be a mentor to somebody else. When you're 25 and a 23-year-old shows up, say, hey, can I go buy you a beer? Or can I buy you a cup of coffee? And I'll tell you about what it's like to work here. You just took a step in being a leader in your organization. Hey, we're right up on time, so if anybody needs to go, I don't want to, you need to do that. Uh, so last two things, because um, I think this is my favorite story about my career, and you asked me to tell some stuff like that. So, and I'm gonna be here, so if you guys wanna talk, hang out. So about five years ago, um, I got a call. I was in the car riding with my wife to the airport to go on a little, we call them a boondoggle. Does anybody know what a boondoggle is? That's something that's disguised, that's something that's supposed to be work related and is disguised as fun. So there were some high achievers in our organization that were getting, got invited to go on a boondoggle. And in the boondoggle, part of the, part of the experience was there was gonna be a quick presentation to the group about kind of some stuff we were doing inside the organization, kind of like what we've done here. And I got this phone call from somebody that was a lot more important than I am. And he said, hey, the guy that's a lot more important than you, that's supposed to make the presentation at this thing, can't get there. And we want you to make it. And I said, you know, I think our phones, I don't, I don't think we've got a good connection here. And I was like, there's no, I'm thinking to myself, I can't make that presentation, that's crazy. He said, no, 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 I just, it'll be, all you gotta do is talk for 15 minutes. I was like, I'm driving to the airport. I don't even have my computer. I did have my computer. <laughs> anyway, so, so anyway, I did it. I made the presentation. I was scared to death because I was in front of a bunch of people that I think are a whole lot more talented than I am. And I was super intimidated. When the meeting was over, a lady walked up to me. I had no idea who she was. And she said, hey, you did a really good job. She goes, you broke down something that made it super simple that was really complicated, and I never heard anybody do it like that. And I was like, I'm pretty simple. But so, so I did it, and, and I walked away, and I go over to one of my colleagues, and I go, who is that lady? And he goes, oh, well, she runs the U.S. practice for our consulting team. She's the senior U.S. consultant, and she's about to become the CEO of, of Aon U.S. And I went, oh, really? And she was like, yeah, and I had no idea who she was. The rest of the story is, 
I had breakfast with her Friday, just this past Friday. She is the CEO of Aon US. She's the most high ranking person in our organization in the United States. Could not be a better person. She has become a mentor for me. And I mean a big one. She is 50% responsible for where I am. And it all happened because somebody called and said, hey, I want you to, I'm gonna voluntold you to go be a speaker at this thing. And she was sitting in the front row. And I had nothing to do with anything I did. I just got asked and I said I would do it. Go do it. Whatever it is you need to do, wherever you need to be, if you go network, if you go meet people, it's not who you know. People say, oh, it's who you know. No, it's not. It's who knows you. Who knows you? Who did you get in front of? Who did you work hard for? Who did you try? Who did you fail in front of? By the way, failing is not a bad thing. We learn a lot from failing. In Silicon Valley, they have a checkbox that says, where have you failed this year? And if you can't check it, if you can't check that box that says I failed, you're in trouble. You know why? It means you're not trying. <laughs> you gotta fail. Okay, so I gave y'all this list. I'm not gonna go over it because we're, we're past time, but I thought this was really cool. I found this last week while I was preparing for this talk and thought, man, how did I run into this? And this is really cool. So a lot of you are going to, this is the list of um, the skills that companies are looking for when they hire um, when you're coming out of college. And you're not going to have them all. And that's okay. Yeah. But you're going to have some of them. Play up to those. Be good at what you're good at. Okay, I, I'm done, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>